Now we move on to learning about how the animal kingdom diversified from earlier eukaryotes. We think that animals are a monophyletic group that evolved from single-celled eukaryotes, which were very similar in structure, size, and shape to the present-day protist group known as the chonoflagellates. So keep in mind from Unit 2 that multicellularity has evolved many times. We've seen it evolve in the land plant group, in fungi, and in animals, as well as in several different multicellular groups of protists. Eventually, the animals have diversified into an amazingly large number of species. More than 1.3 animal species have been described by scientists. And because scientists are discovering new species at such a rapid rate, they estimate that the total number may even be as many as 8 million or more species. Evidence from both fossils and DNA helps us to estimate that the common ancestor of all living animals lived somewhere around 770 million years ago. The earliest fossils that have been discovered so far of animals date back to 560 billion years ago. Keep in mind that since we haven't found all of the fossils yet that are out there, it's often the case that the ancestor of a particular group lived sometime earlier than the oldest known fossils at this time. The molecular evidence helps us to pinpoint the date more accurately. Sponges and nadarians are two of the groups they're actually phyla within the animal kingdom that diverged from other animals the longest time ago. In a moment, we'll go over their bodily structure and how it's relatively simple when compared to other types of animal groups. Sponges come from a phylum known as periphera. They're sessile animals, that means they don't move, they're rooted in a particular place in the ocean, and they're suspension feeders. Okay, these marine organisms capture food particles that have been suspended in the water. They use special cells to create a current and draw water through pores or holes that eventually draw the water into a central cavity and flush it out through an opening at the top. As the water moves through pores, they can then collect food particles such as phytoplankton and zooplankton from the water or organic nutrients. We say that sponges lack two true tissues. Okay? Tissues are groups of cells that function together as a unit to carry out a particular function or mission. Okay, so the definition of tissue is the same in plants and animals. We say that sponges lack true tissues because basically all of the cells in the sponge work together for the same function. We don't have separate groups of tissues with different functions. If we look closely at a sponge, we can see several different types of cells that reflect the evolutionary history of the sponge. Two of these, chonocytes and amoebocytes, are similar in structure to the protists with similar sounding names. The chonocytes have flagella, though that's the whip-like structure that moves back and forth and generates a water current that helps pull the water through the sponge and expose it to the suspended food particles that it needs to collect. The amoebocytes are mobile just like the protists called amoebas. These mobile cells move around the body of the sponge 
and are involved in digesting the food and in the structure of the sponge's body. Both DNA evidence from molecular biology and morphological similarities, those are structural similarities between the sponges and chonoflagellates, suggest that animals evolved from an ancestor that was very much like the modern day chonoflagellates. If we look at a sponge, we can see these particular cell types. And if you were to see a picture of a chonoflagellate, it would be almost identical in structure to this chonoflagellate cell. Also note the amoebocytes shown in blue here. And the body of the sponge in the right hand corner indicates that the sponge is kind of irregularly shaped. Okay, so it's lacking any type of symmetry. We'll learn in a moment how that's another feature that distinguishes groups of animals from one another. So recall that the Nidarians belong to a phylum that diverged from other animals shortly after the sponges did. Okay, so they've been separate from more advanced groups of animals for a fairly long period of time. Nidarians appear to have evolved about 680 million years ago. Since that time, they've diversified into a wide range of forms. Some of these forms are sessile, meaning that they stay rooted in one place, like the corals on a coral reef. Others are mobile, like the jellyfish. Okay. The Nidarians consist of three different groups, the Hydrozoa, which are sessile organisms with long tentacles that wave around in the water and collect food. The jellyfish are another group, the Cyphozoa, and the Anthozoa include corals and sea anemones. Nidarians have a very simple body plan. Okay, it's basically a sac with a central digestive compartment. Okay, this compartment is known as the gastrovascular cavity. So gastro refers to digestion because that's one of its functions. And vascular refers to the fact that water flows through it. Keep in mind that a cavity is always a type of opening. So in Nidarians, food goes in and waste goes out through the same opening. That's one of the distinguishing features between the Nidarians and other more advanced animal groups. Nidarians are carnivores. They use tentacles and stinging cells to capture, stun, paralyze, and consume their prey. They also have a very simple nervous system. It's non-centralized. That means that the nerves are found all throughout the body and that they don't direct sensory signals into a particular area. Okay, so they're lacking a brain. The nervous system cells simply interact with stimuli and react appropriately without sending the signals to a more complex structure like the brain or the spinal cord. Okay, a very important period of time during the evolution of animals was known as the Cambrian Explosion. It occurred obviously during the Cambrian era and it was a narrow period of time from 535 to 525 million years ago when we start to see a rapid increase in the appearance of many different groups of living animals in the fossil record. So it's the first time that we see many different animal phyla appearing as fossils. So we think that this was a very rapid period in evolutionary history. Data shows that fossils collected during the Cambrian explosion time contain the oldest known fossils of about half of all the currently living animal phyla. There may be more phyla present at that time that we simply haven't collected yet. But prior to the Cambrian explosion, fossils are known from relatively few phyla. Certainly from the sponges and the nidarians, but not from too many others. 
This phylogeny shows the approximate time period during which different groups of organisms diverged. Fossils from the Cambrian period also include the first animals that contain hard mineralized skeletons. Okay, this was an important evolutionary adaptation because the skeletons, even if they weren't like vertebrate skeletons, protected organisms from predation and other risks. Most of the fossils from this period are fossils of organisms that we now call bilaterians. Okay, this is a monophyletic clade and it includes most of the living animals today. It's defined by animals that have a complete digestive tract. So that means that the opening for ingestion or taking in food is different from the opening that wastes go out of. They also have a bilaterally symmetric form. Okay, that means that they have a right and a left side and there's only one way that you can draw a line down the center of the animal and have the right and left sides be mirror images of one another. During the Cambrian explosion, we also see the first hunting pred predators diversifying during this period. In the fact that there was such a great amount of predation probably explained why so many defensive adaptations like exoskeletons and spines also evolved at this time. The predatory selection pressure stimulated selection for these particular types of adaptations. The drawing on the right and the photo of the fossil on the left show some examples of organisms that were present in the oceans at the time of the Cambrian explosion. Notice that this fossil of the 530 million year old Hallucigenia is a fairly simple organism, but it has a head and a tail end that are different, making it a bilaterian. So there are several hypotheses that explain the cause of the Cambrian explosion and the decline of the Eddicarian biota. One is that these new predator-prey relationships were evolving. When there were fairly few types of organisms and not many of them resorted to preying upon one another, there wasn't much selection pressure for all of these adaptations that started to appear during the Cambrian explosion. So once there's new selection pressure, we tend to see something called adaptive radiation. Okay, remember that term from unit one? It's when there's rapid diversification in a short period of time. Okay, it's usually stimulated by a certain type of selection pressure. We also know that there was a rise in the atmospheric concentrations of oxygen. Okay, recall that the Earth's early atmosphere contained no oxygen, but photosynthetic organisms were responsible for the accumulation of oxygen, first in the water, and eventually that oxygen escaped the water and entered the atmosphere. So it's possible that once oxygen levels reached a critical threshold, that they stimulated the evolution of aerobic respiration. There were also genes that were probably involved in the diversification during the Cambrian explosion. The Hox gene complexes are responsible for different types of body plans of organisms. Those included things like traits like bilateral symmetry, the number of segments that each organism had, and the types of appendages that they had. So many scientists believe that all three of these factors probably played a role in the diversification during the Cambrian explosion. Okay, so keep in mind, keep in mind that prior to the Cambrian explosion, as well as during that time period, all animals, as well as all plants, lived in the oceans. Okay, this occurred before the invasion of land by either of these groups. 
During the Cambrian explosion, we see a lot more body plans than we had seen previously in the Ediacarian biota. Body plans are sets of morphological and developmental traits. Okay, so that included what the organism looked like and what its features were, as well as the developmental traits, such as changes throughout an organism's lifetime. Comparing these body plans provides a way for us to distinguish between some of the major groups of animals. The three important aspects of animal body plans are symmetry, which could be radial or bilateral, and we'll go over those in more detail in a moment. The types of tissues present in the organism. Animals have one, two, or three tissue types, as well as body cavities, okay, like the gastrovascular cavity versus the complete digestive system that we've already talked about. So sponges are simple animals that are lacking any type of symmetry. We previously saw a picture of a sponge that was kind of irregular in shape. There was no way to draw a line down it and have the right and left sides be a mirror image of one another. Some animals have what we call radial symmetry with no front and back or left and right. So a lot of these organisms are either spherical or cylindrical in shape. And those that have two-sided symmetry a clear right and left side have what we call bilateral symmetry. Okay, remember that the prefix bi means two and lateral means sides. Okay, so that's why bilateral symmetry means two-sided symmetry. This diagram here illustrates radial symmetry in organisms and objects. So notice that in both the flower pot and the sea anemone, there are several different ways that we can draw a line down the center of the organism and have the right and left sides match. In the sea anemone, the tentacles on each side may look a little bit different, but that's only because they're moving around. They're the same in size and structure at all points on the organism. So radial symmetry is considered a simpler or more ancestral trait because it appeared in the fossil record first. Organisms and objects with bilateral symmetry can only be bisected or cut in half in one way that would result in identical sides. So bilaterally symmetrical animals all have these particular parts Okay, they all have a top or a back side, which is known scientifically as the dorsal side. You may have heard of sharks as having a dorsal fin. That triangular fin that sticks up through the water and is a sign that danger is near is known as a dorsal fin. So maybe you can remember it that way. The ventral side is the opposite of the dorsal side. It's the bottom or the belly side. Okay, so we could say that your belly button is ventrally located and your backbone is dorsally located. All bilaterally symmetrical animals also have a right and a left side, as well as a head or front end that's known as anterior, and a posterior or back end. Okay, so we could say that your head is anteriorly located and your feet are posteriorly located. They're at opposite ends of your body. Most bilaterians also have sensory equipment or sensory organs, which include a central nervous system, that's a brain and a spinal cord, that are concentrated at the anterior end. So they may have nervous system cells throughout the body but these cells are sending the signal to a particular part of the body, the brain, 
where the meaning of these signals is interpreted. Okay. One reason that bilateral symmetry is so important is because it gives organisms control over the direction of movement. Okay. Generally, animals tend to move in the direction of their head, or they move head first. And it's important to have the sensory location located in the direction that the organism is moving so that they're most likely to interpret stimuli as they encounter it. Radially symmetrical animals, in contrast, are often sessile. That means that they stay attached to a substrate or they may be planktonic. That means that they drift throughout the water column or they're very weak swimmers. Okay, so this includes things like jellyfish. They have relatively little control over their direction of movement. It tends to be currents in the water that direct where they're going. The structure of bilateral animals allows them to move actively. Okay, both their central nervous system helps with coordinating different body parts so that the organism can move effectively. And having a head helps them to determine which direction is the direction to move forward. Animal body plans are also very variable with regard to tissue organization. Okay, remember that tissues are collections of cells with specialized functions that act together as a unit to carry out that particular function. Okay, they're geographically isolated from other tissues. So we have all of the cells of a particular tissue type located adjacent to one another, and we have to move to a different part of the body to encounter other tissue types. Okay, we don't have cells of two tissue types mixed together throughout the body. That's what that means. During the development of an organism, Layers known as germ layers, those are layers of cells in early embryonic development, give rise to various tissues and organs in the animal embryo. So we have several tissues grouped together that form a particular organ. Okay, And examples of organs in animals are things like the heart, the brain, the spinal cord, and the stomach. Okay, stomachs have different tissue types. They have smooth muscle on the outside that helps with the motion of the stomach and the stimulating of the mixing of food. And then there's also stomach lining, which is a different type of tissue. Okay, when we talk about animals that have true tissues, so these would be all animals except for what type? Can you remember what type of animal has no true tissues? Okay, if you said sponges, you'd be correct. Okay, because they essentially have cells that all work together for one function. They don't have a different type of tissue that does something else. So all animals with true tissues have at least two tissue layers. Okay, these are the ectoderm and the endoderm. These are layers that in early embryonic development give rise to, the ectoderm would give rise to the outer covering and in some phyla, the central nervous system. Okay, Remember that ecto means on the outside of and derm tends to mean skin or covering. The endoderm is the innermost germ layer. Okay, Remember that the prefix endo means inside of. And this layer gives rise to the digestive tract and many of the organs. In vertebrates, these would include things like the liver and the lungs. Okay, so these are layers that start out as a single cell layer, but as the cell types diversify, as the organism develops, they give rise to many different tissue types. Many organisms also have a third germ layer, okay, known as the mesoderm. Mesoderm means in the middle skin, 
Okay, so it's the layer that's found in between the ectoderm and the endoderm. And it gives rise to organs like muscles and many other types of organs like the heart. Okay, so all bilaterians have ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. But simpler organisms like the nadarians and a few other phyla have only ectoderm and endoderm. Most bilaterians have a true body cavity, that's a hole or an opening, known as a coelom. Okay, they also tend to have a fluid filled or air filled space between the digestive tract and an outer body wall. So this space is really important because it helps to cushion the suspended organs, which helps to protect them so that they don't rub against each other and wear out quickly as the organism moves. And they act as a hydrostatic skeleton. Okay, that's something that helps to keep the organism buoyant in the water. It also enables internal organs to move independently of the body wall. Okay, and this is important for carrying out specialized functions. Think about your heart. It needs to be able to beat independently of the body. If you're sitting still on a couch watching TV and the rest of your body is not moving, your heart still needs to be moving independently in order to carry out its function. So this body cavity allows organisms to have specialized organs with specialized functions. Think of a jellyfish that kind of moves its whole body together at once. It doesn't have separate organs that are doing separate things at a different time because the jellyfish isn't a bilaterian and it doesn't have a coelom. This diagram here shows a, a picture of a coelom in a relatively simple bilaterian, an earthworm. Notice the digestive tract is a hollow opening. Okay, and this worm actually does have one opening at the head end and a separate opening at the tail end. The body cavity is that semicircular shaped opening that helps to suspend organisms from the rest of its body and keep it separate from the ectoderm or outer covering. The colors here, the blue, red, and the yellow, show from which tissue layer each of these tissues arose during embryonic development, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So this phylogeny here summarizes the evolutionary relationships of all of the animals. Okay, another term for the kingdom Animalia is Metazoa. Okay, so all animals are concluded in the group Metazoa. We separate the sponges out first based on what character? Okay, hopefully you said the lack of true tissue types. And then all of the other organisms, those that have at least two different tissue types, are known as the eumetazoa. Okay, so we have two phyla that split off particularly early, the nadarians and the tenophores. Okay, don't worry about the tenophores since we didn't discuss them in any great detail. We then have the remaining group of organisms that all shared a common ancestor around 670 million years ago as the bilaterians. Okay, and now see that the bilaterians are broken into three major groups. Deuterostomes, Lophotrochozoans, and Ecdysozoans. Okay, these are each monophyletic clades within the group bilaterians. Also note that most of the animal diversity is represented by the bilaterians. Okay, there are relatively few number of phyla that are not bilaterians. So most of the phyla and most of the species are alive today are bilaterians. Okay, and it's very important that you remember that. 
This was a very successful feature in animal evolution, and it's responsible for the great amount of diversity in that group. Okay, so this slide here summarizes some of the things that you're expected to remember from that animal phylogeny. Okay, all animals share a common ancestor. So what type of group does that make animals? Okay, think back to unit one. Okay, hopefully you said monophyletic. Okay, if all evolved from the same common ancestor, that makes a group monophyletic. The sponges are the basal animals that were the first to diverge from other groups, okay? It's very important that you understand what features of the sponge make them simpler and that they did diverge first. And then eumetazoans include the animals with true tissue types. And then we have the bilaterians including most of the animal diversity around today. And those are distinguished from other eumetazoans by the inclusion of a third tissue type, the mesoderm, okay? Whereas other eumetazoans have just an endoderm and an ectoderm. Most of the animal diversity is also represented by invertebrates, okay? Uh, since we're vertebrates, we're probably most interested in those. Um, so are most of our domestic animals, like our pets and our um, agricultural livestock. But invertebrates, those lacking a backbone, are actually a lot more diverse. If you look back at the phylogeny from the previous slide, you'll see that only one phylum is called chordata. Okay, there's one phylum, chordata, that includes all of the vertebrates. But not all organisms in that phylum are vertebrates. Okay, we then have lots of other phyla, and the phylogeny we've presented doesn't include all the phyla, just some of the major groups. Okay, so we've got about 35 invertebrate phyla, and only one phylum that contains some vertebrates.